If you would, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 9 with us this morning. Mark chapter 9, and look at some of those words there. We're going to be spending the majority of time in Mark chapter 9 this morning. But there's a phrase that pops up every couple of years and every so often when I talk to folks about God's Word, and that is sometimes thrown at Christians, why can't you just pay attention to the words in red? I understand the sentiment there, but I think it's missing a lot of the point. If we only look at Jesus' words, we're going to miss out on a lot. You know, Christianity in the Bible is kind of unique compared to most religions that use other texts. I don't know if you've noticed this or looked much into this. Most other religions don't give a whole lot of context. Most religions consist of rabbis and prophets and teachers and elders that said long ago this proverb, and that's about the extent of the wisdom that it has. God's Word, in many ways, is unique, and it is expertly crafted and designed that, yes, the things that Jesus and others say are important, but just as much as is important is the context surrounding the things they said. Because just as we did a little bit this morning in the Bible class in places like Luke chapter 11, sometimes it's not just the words that are said, it's the context of everything around it. It's how it was said. It was things that was going through people's minds. It's the wisdom that you can see and how responses were given. Questions were asked. And not specifically just the lessons that can be taken away from what is said. We studied the parallel account of Mark chapter 9 a couple months back in our Tuesday night studies. And as I looked more and more at that text, there was more and more and more I wanted to say. Because while we are aware, most of us, I imagine, of what Mark 9, verse 23 and 24 say, the context surrounding those things is a lot more than about a young man being healed of demonic possession. It's ways to help our faith. Mark 9, beginning in verse 23 and 24, Jesus said to the father of the child, If you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It's not just about how demonic possession works there. It's not just about disciples that were unable to cast out this spirit and Jesus had to be the one to do it. It's about ways in which we fight Satan and sometimes we feel hopeless. To back up to give the full context of Mark chapter 9, back up with me to Mark chapter 9, there in verse 14. And when he, that being Jesus, came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, running to him and greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit this isn't very different from most of the days that jesus was out teaching he approaches his disciples he approaches a crowd he approaches a multitude sometimes being followers of his sometimes being strangers who are seeking to be healed sometimes filled with scribes and pharisees who are adding extra bits of chaos to the situation by throwing out accusations, by asking questions, by leading people on. Put yourselves in the shoe of the Father in verse 17. I came here because I have a dire need. I came here because I need help. My son is possessed. He is hurting. He has a mute spirit. I want to help him, but the road to get that help, Satan, it seems, has caused as much chaos as he can to get there. You can't just approach Jesus and ask for help. There's a multitude. It's not just a multitude of other people that are seeking healing. It's a multitude that are also sown in with scribes and Pharisees that are causing chaos and sowing dissension and trying to spread and split 
the disciples and tell them not to follow this Jesus. He's a false prophet. He's a false Messiah. All of this chaos is going on and he just wants help. There is one person to ultimately give credit to all the distractions and all the chaos that is being sown. It's Satan. I think sometimes our lives end up like that. We need help. We need brethren. We need elders. We need folks that we can lean on. We need prayers. We try to go to God. We try to deal with a temptation or a situation in our life. And the moment we try to lean on God, it feels like Satan just amps up the heat. They add more problems. How many times does it feel like you're dealing with one stress and you get six calls, 14 texts, three emails, and two people knocking at your door with more problems to add on top of what you're dealing with? How many times do you feel like you go to people and you're asking for help and then other situations arise? Other problems show up. They also have their own problems. They have their own distractions. They can't make it and be what you need to be. Do you see why so many people probably would respond in a similar way to the man in verse 24? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Feels like I can't breathe. There's a reason David describes sin as drowning in the mire and stuck in the muck. It's because sometimes it feels like it's not just one issue that we deal with and we move on. It's a million little things on top of bigger things on top of bigger things sometimes. Because that's how Satan operates. He will harass us at every opportunity that he can. Verse 18 continues. The man describing what happens to his son, whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Satan is harassing me. I've gone for help and I've not even received the help that I've asked for. And my son is still in pain. As a father, I am in pain because I see him going through this and it hurts me too. Verse 22, he continues describing. And often he has thrown him both into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He has desperately tried to get rid of these problems. He has gone to extreme ways to try and deal with this situation. And he's still hurting. Can you help us? Satan, it feels like, and sometimes just flat out does, drive us to our wit's end and make us feel helpless. When he approaches the disciples and They try, and they can't cast it out. When verse 29 tells us, I'm sorry, verse 28 tells us, why could we not cast it out, the disciples ask. Verse 21 and 22, so the father was asked, how long has this been happening? And he answered, from childhood. This has been happening for years. This has been happening for a while. It mentions child. We don't know how old the child is at this time when he's coming and asking for help. He doesn't mention how young the child was when it started, but it's not last week. It's not a month ago. It's probably even more than a year ago. From childhood, he describes, denotes some kind of long period of time these issues have been dealt with. Satan has made me feel helpless. As a parent trying to help my child, and there's nothing that I can do, as they've struggled with these things and they've not known where to turn as we've taken them to people to seek help and they've been unable to help. There's a hopeless, helpless situation that creeps in. Until finally the father is just crying. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I don't know where else to turn. I don't know what else to do. Maybe I don't even know what faith totally is at this point. Because he just feels alone and he feels isolated. He's in a crowd of people. 
but they don't care about him. They're fighting over things that probably to him sound ridiculous. He's worried about his son right now. He's gone to people that he hoped would help, have helped other people, like in verse 18, and no such success. The disciples themselves don't understand in verse 28 why they were not able to cast it out. How many times I've gone to folks, and I know you've gone to folks, you've asked for help and we try our best, or they try their best, but they don't have the answers that you're looking for. One of the worst things that I have to respond to people sometimes, and even more so against my personality, I like to fix the problem. I want to be able to move on. I want to be able to help. But just to simply say, I don't know. I can give you what advice I can. I can pray with you. I can help you. I can do what I can. But sometimes there's just no magical button to fix to make it all better. Sometimes that results in us just feeling isolated. But I think there's an important difference between isolation and folks not knowing how to help. Isolation means no one can help you. You don't have help around you. You don't have people to lean on. That looks a lot more like Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 20 where he feels like there's no one I can turn to. I'm the only one left in Israel that has faith. And God has to correct him and say, no, there are hundreds that have not bowed the knee to Baal. The man feels alone right now, but there are people here that have tried to help, that are trying to help. Most importantly, Jesus is here and wants to help and is willing to help. Just because Satan may make us feel isolated doesn't mean that we are. Just because someone may not know how to answer in the time and place and to magically fix the issue or to give you the perfect verse or phrase to make the day and problem be better and to go away does not mean that you are alone. There is great power in fervent prayer. There is great help in knowing that there are other people that care about you, that are looking out for you, that are doing their best, that are looking to other resources, that are trying what they can to help you. But not every problem can just be fixed like that when we bring it to somebody. Not not every problem will go away. Sometimes things will even happen like the father and his child. This has gone on for years. This has gone on for a long period of time, and it hasn't stopped. So in those cases, there is confidence in knowing that Christ cares about us. When he describes his child often throwing himself both into fire and water to destroy him, when he's begging for compassion, if you can help us, Jesus answers, if you can believe, if you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And he casts out the demon. But I think more than just the resolution, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn to recognize dangers to our faith. Because that's the key verse there in verse 24. The father recognizes, I have a problem. I came to you with help for my son because he's the one that's got a demon possessing him. He's the one with a malady that can't be fixed. But I've realized something along the way through this conversation even. My faith is lacking too. Help my unbelief help me come through so that my faith does not crumble in the midst of a problem that you can fix and so let's again look at the text and notice some of the problems that pop up for all of us first and foremost it started there in the very first verse 
Don't get distracted by other people. Sometimes when we look for help, we need that help. We want others to be able to help fix the problem. And they respond in an unloving way. We are human beings. Like we read Matthew 7 and verse 12 in Bible class this morning. We would hope everyone treats each other the way they want to be treated. The reality is that is not always the case. I've walked in to worship with brethren and I'm having a rough weekend. I've had a rough week. I've had a rough, rough month. I'm there to be encouraged. I'm there to be enriched. And pettiness and malice pops up. As it does in any church. As it does with any people. Fighting picks up among the family. And that's what brethren are. We're family. And while I'm struggling, other people are too. When I look for help and sometimes get blown off because I'm not receiving what I need in the moment. I shouldn't let that turn in then to my own bitterness and malice. I shouldn't let that distract me from knowing that I have a God that cares about me. I shouldn't let that color who my brethren are for the rest of eternity to think that they don't care, they can have bad days too. They can struggle as well. Satan is using this to sow seeds of chaos. He's that roaring lion that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. He doesn't just attack on one front, he comes at us from multiple angles. Don't let him make a bad situation worse. Don't stack sin on top of sin. Ask God the same way that the man asked, help my unbelief. Help me recognize what's a distraction and what's a temptation and what's a danger. Satan is very good at using both. Don't let previous attempts to help discourage you either. Because sometimes a problem doesn't go away because we make excuses like this. I've never been successful up till now. I've tried and I've tried to conquer this temptation and it hasn't gone away. I've seen so many doctors about this sickness and I'm still struggling with it. I've gone to preacher after elder after a faithful brother and sister in Christ to pray with me and help me. I'm still hurting. I still can't get over this. I'm still in mourning. I still don't know what to do. I've tried everything and it's not worked. Help us to recognize those attitudes for what they are. It's Satan trying to drag us down and to keep us down. Maybe you've heard this phrase a lot. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Nothing else I can do. I've tried it all. I've been at this. I'm just too old to care anymore. Unfortunately, I think there are a lot of older folks in the church that will lose their souls because they just give up just a little bit too soon. Imagine if the man stopped caring and never brought his son to Christ here. And he never gets better. And he never gets healed. He never gets the help that was just around the corner. How frustrating and awful a life that would be. Sometimes we stop just short of where we need to be because we get too focused on past failures, past attempts, past people maybe that have hurt us and have not been able to do anything. And we don't look forward with hope. I think that's in part why the man cried out, Lord, help my unbelief. Because I know what needs to be done. I know that God is powerful. I know that God is, can help me. But in this moment, I am really struggling. Help me. So that I don't stop short of where I need to be. 
Don't let the amount of time that passes become an issue. When he asks them, how long has this been happening? And he answers, from childhood. Sometimes we let that be the thing that stops us. Well, never been successful up until now. I've tried this for years. I've not been able to beat this addiction. I've not been able to conquer this temptation. I've tried pushing bad influences out of my life and they keep coming back. I've given people chances and they still keep hurting me. I've tried to get over this problem, this sorrow, this temptation, and it's just not working. We have an eternity to look forward to with our God where there will be no tears, no sorrow, no pain, no temptation. Maybe you've struggled with something your entire life up till now. Maybe you struggle with something as long as you live. You have your own thorns in the flesh as Paul did. Some things that don't go away. Some things that you can't remember a time when this was not an issue. How long is that problem going to look like in the scope of eternity? Even the worst of situations can be overcome. In this life, or even better, in the next. Maybe you struggled with something while you were here, but then it's going to quickly pass away and be forgotten once you're in eternity with God in heaven. Those things that seemed all-consuming will be a thorn that will be plucked out. It will be gone. Sometimes the answer is, unfortunately, when we don't want to hear it, my grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes the answer is you've tried and you weren't very successful before because you're going to learn and grow from this. Maybe you tried and you went to the wrong places and they weren't able to help. Don't let the past attempts color your faith in the future. Let it become something to grow through and overcome and don't be paralyzed by it. Because that seems to be the issue for the man and the father in verse 22. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. At this point, the father is a man like a deer stuck in the headlights. He's finally reached his goal. He came through the crowd. He pushed his way through the multitude. He overcame the screaming of the scribes and Pharisees trying to discredit him. He is talking with Christ. The one who he knows and he believes is able to cure his son. But boy, is it hard to say that. When it finally reaches the point that he can talk with him doesn't know what to say if there's any way possible if you can help if there's anything you can do help us help us not just my son help me because it's taken its toll on me too because I recognize I'm struggling with my faith too in the same way that he's wrestled with this demon And I think part of Jesus' commendation there in verse 23, if you believe, if I can help you, where is the if in this equation? All things are possible to him who believes. I think we need to recognize the danger to our faith 
kind of like we talked about this morning, examining and listening to what other people say, we also need to examine and listen to what we say. I don't think this was some blasphemous statement the Father made in verse 22. Jesus doesn't treat it like that. What he does is he pauses. If you believe. If I can help you. There's a dangerous word that you just put at the beginning of that sentence. There's a seed that Satan has planted in your heart. And I don't know if you realize it is in many ways what Christ is saying there. What's in the heart eventually comes out of the mouth. There's a lack of faith there that the man recognizes in verse 24. You're right. I did just say that. I did just voice if my God and if my Savior can help. and not with confidence knowing that he can. I did just struggle with this concept and I did just voice something in a way that maybe I didn't fully mean, but that's sure what I said. In the depths of despair, when we're struggling, when we're hurting, I will be the first to admit, and I doubt there's anybody here that wouldn't. I've spoken like this. I've said things that immediately have been shocked that that just came out of my mouth. Whether it be out of anger or malice or frustration or hurt or lack of faith, that gives us pause when we actually stop and listen to what is said. Even more so that gives me pause when I have blessed brothers and sisters in Christ or my spouse or my parents or someone point out did you just say that? It's a wake up call. Hopefully it's in a loving way as I believe Jesus meant it here. Oh. Satan isn't just outside the gate prowling. He's planting seeds inside my heart and I didn't realize so, Lord, help my unbelief. And that's how we find help. These are basic answers that in many ways we see examples of in this account. Sometimes that's frustrating. Like we've talked about with the zeal class that we've been studying on Wednesday night. The person comes up to you and asks, how can I increase my zeal? How can I increase my faith and my attitude when it comes to God? And at first glance, it may seem like, well, the answers are kind of simple that I've heard a thousand times. But they're simple because the gospel is simple. They're easy to grasp. They take a lifetime, maybe even an eternity to master. And so we need to have the attitude of the man in verse 24. If I just voiced, if you can do anything, then I need to counter this by voicing something else even stronger. Lord, I believe. Help me. I don't know whether that was in tears. I don't know whether it was loud. I don't know whether it was a whisper. any of them would have had the same effect. I do believe. I do know that you are God. I do know that you are my Savior, and that you can, you do help, and you want to help. Don't just say it in your head. Voice it out loud has a lot more power to that than we might realize at first. That's why when we talk about confession, there's a vocal component there. Whether you're confessing Him as your Lord and Savior before you're baptized, or you're confessing sins and asking for help, it's not just in private, it's not just in my head, it's I'm putting it out there and I'm making it even firmer. 
I want to do away with this temptation. I want the help of my God. I want to serve my Savior. It's a very basic faith principle, but it holds a lot of power. It means a lot more. And to understand and to keep repeating that I know Christ will answer my prayers. It may not always be in the way I want it to be answered, like when Paul prayed to Christ and asked for the thorn to be removed. But he does answer. When you continue into verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead. So that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. When he had the faith, when he turned to Christ, that's all Christ was waiting for. That's what he wanted. It would have been nothing for the father just to cry out, my son has a demon, and Jesus said, okay, demon, come out. And that'd be it. But I think there's more to this, and I think in many ways, that's why this account is recorded for us. It wasn't just the son that needed help, it was the father. It wasn't just an issue of demon possession, there was also an issue of faith and a heart that has also been corrupted by Satan. And the father needed to know. The son needed to know. If I bring these problems to my God, he listens. He cares and he wants to help. I believe that's why he braved the crowd in the first place. That although there is a great multitude surrounding him, although the scribes are arguing, he took the first step because I believe what he said in verse 4. I do believe, I do know that this Jesus can heal my son. It's with every step forward as Satan threw more and more things in his path, it became a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more difficult. Until by the end of the conversation, he's struggling with that if you can do anything until Christ gives him that extra boost of reassurance. You're right. I know, I believe that you can help. Help me where it's lacking. I think you and I know what Romans chapter 5 talks about. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. God in showing his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Mark 9 is proof of Roman 5 concept. It's one of many examples that men like Paul and men like you and I would look back to and know. You're right. I don't just believe this because Romans 5 mentions it. I don't just believe it because someone else tells me to believe it. I know this. I believe it myself because I have seen it done. I have seen God in action. I have seen the compassion and care from Christ. That He wants me to approach Him in the same way. He did not dismiss the Father. He answered him in verse 19, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. If there's an issue that could not be helped, come to me. If you're disappointed by my other followers, like in verse 18, when the disciples could not cast him out, bring him to me. When you turn to other brethren and they disappoint you, as sometimes does happen, we know, or we should know, we have an advocate with the Father who will not disappoint. 
who wants to hear from us, who will help us and care about us. Sometimes knowing that in our mind, voicing that out loud and putting it into action, there's a bit of a separation there. Jesus is there saying, I'm here trying to help bridge the gap. I'm not dismissing you. I'm showing you that I care. When asking questions like, how long has this been happening? He already knows the answer to that, but he wants the Father to know I care. He didn't need to ask it. He asked it to show compassion. It didn't change whether or not he could heal the demon. If the demon's only been in there a week, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Or if it's been in there too long, then I'm sorry, I can't help you. That's not why he asked the question. It's because he looked upon a broken spirit who was struggling and who needed help and needed to show him, I care about you. I'm interested in you, your son's not just physical well-being, but your spiritual well-being. That's why he asked those questions. So that the man might learn what I think he probably at one point already knew. To humble himself. I wonder how many of us would respond in the same way as the father in verse 22 and 23. There's no record of debate back and forth. There's no hemming and hawing around this. He says something, and immediately it's pointed out to him, that's not quite the way you need to say that. If you can help me, if I can, all things are possible to him who believes. Lord, I believe. Sometimes we try to justify and make excuses for the things that we say. That we know was not right that we know could have been worded better. That we know maybe comes from a little seed of doubt and despair and frustration and bitterness and sorrow. Human beings excel at trying to make excuses. I'm encouraged and strive to be more like this father. If you believe, you're right, I was in the wrong. I believe. Nothing else needed to be said. Nothing needed to be clarified. Nothing needed to be made excuse for. God, you are right. Let me just humble myself and say what needs to be said. So that you can help me like you wanted to all along. So that his heart could be reassured. So that the demon could be cast out. So that he could get the help that he was longing for and has been searching for for so long. Sometimes that's our problem. We get close. We know what we need to do to be saved. We know where we need to turn in order to get help. But we don't do what the Father did. We don't take what is ultimately the simple path. Humble ourselves. Ask God for help. Don't make excuses. Just do what needs to be done and leave the rest in His hands. That's the simple answer. That's the easy way for our faith to be increased and for us to get the help that we need. I think there's one last little tidbit here that's in Mark chapter 9 that I find interesting. After the situation is over in verse 28, when Jesus had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I think sometimes we get too caught up in the words that Jesus said there and we miss the simple message. Just like the Father needed help from Christ, 
His own apostles needed help. They need prayer. They need to turn to God. They need to rely on him. They were no different. So just like the father, just like his own apostles that walked with him day in and day out. Do you need help? Does your faith need to be increased? Are you struggling with sin and temptation? Or is there sorrow or is there hardship in your life that feels overwhelming? This response is a simple one, and it's one, if you have been there for any length of time, you have heard hundreds, if not thousands, of times by now. Turn to Christ and ask for help, and he will lift you up. Be strong, be courageous. For the Lord your God is with you. Turn to him and ask for forgiveness. And he is faithful and just to forgive you. Lord, help my unbelief. If that is an area that you are struggling in this morning, we have the opportunity for you to do so. The water is ready. We'd be happy to help you to come out of sin. Come out of darkness if you realize that you need help so that he can help you, so that we can rejoice with him that another soul has been saved. If you are here this morning and your faith is struggling, temptations, sorrow, whatever it may be, feels like a lot, you have the opportunity. Ask for help. Ask for prayers. Come forward this morning Approach someone that you trust privately. Talk to them. If something needs to be taken care of, be like the man in Mark 9. Push through the crowd. Don't care who is watching. Don't care what others might say. God wants to help you. Christ wants to help you. And I, for one, and I believe everyone here, wants to help you the same too. So whatever the case may be this morning, if we can help you, if you know Christ can help you, then let us do so. As together, we stand and sing the song that has been selected.